Hi, I'm Dr. Regu Authory with Authory Facial Plastics. One of the videos that I created several years ago, which has gotten a lot of interest on YouTube, is about fat transfer. Facial fat transfer has really become a very, very popular procedure, so I decided to kind of do an update on this older video. Some of the techniques have changed, and I really want to include a lot of the newer information and all of these types of things, so that's the purpose of this video. So let's just jump right right on into this and kind of give all of you a little idea of what fat transfer is, what it can accomplish, and what are the good things and bad things. First of all, fat transfer is not something that's brand new. Fat transfer has been around for a really, really long time. Fat was one of the first natural body tissues that surgeons looked at when they thought about augmenting tissue. So, for example, after World War I and World War II, there were a lot of soldiers that were left with deformities in their face or other places in their body. So even though that the wound may have healed, there may have been a large chunk missing or some sort of contour abnormality. Lo and behold, so surgeons thought, hey, why don't we get some fat and we can put it in there and plump up the tissues. That's where the idea of fat transfer really started. However, these initial experiments, I will say, with fat transfer weren't super successful. There was a lot of complications in that the fat would sometimes harden, you'd get balls, you'd get granulomas, you'd get contour abnormalities. So fat transfer has kind of gone through this waxing and waning phase of popularity up until probably the early 2000s. One of the novel things that really came about in the late 90s, early 2000s, is micro fat transfer. This is very different than the fat transfer that had been done previously. By the way, right off the bat, everything that I'm about to say here really is about facial fat transfer. We're not even gonna jump into the body fat transfer because that's a whole different ball game. I wanna make sure that the viewer understands that. So, moving along, facial fat transfer. Many of you have may have had uh, a friend, a parent, um, someone that you know who may have had facial plastic surgery decades ago had some degree of fat transfer and complained about it. They said, you know, it was lumpy, it was bumpy, da 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 da. So the idea of micro fat transfer that really happened in the late 90s, early 2000s really revolutionized the world. What is it? First of all, it differs from regular fat transfer is that when we harvest the fat, we're actually using a smaller cannula, okay? So many of you may have seen TV shows where they show uh, liposuction. You see a guy sitting there and really kind of going at it. That's really meant for body liposuction. Those are large cannulas that are really used for aggressively removing large quantities of fat. For facial fat transfer, if we used that type of cannula, you're gonna have a problem because the fat molecules that you're gonna get are just too big. And you're going to have problems with lumpy bumpiness and all these types of things. So this is why it's super uber uber important to really go to someone who knows about facial fat transfer because this is not the type of procedure where you can go in and say, hey, I'm getting some liposuction anyway. Can you use some of that fat and dump it in my face? It doesn't work that way. Fat that's harvested for facial fat transfer needs to be harvested in a specific manner so that it can be used for facial fat transfer. Fat harvested using other techniques may or may not be able to use for facial fat transfer. So let's start with that right there. So fat transfer to the face should not really be used uh, or been, be described as a procedure where you're going, oh, by the way, let's go add some volume to the face. It doesn't work like that. You really want to think about this as a real standalone procedure and look at the rationale of why you're doing it. So the, the small cannulas for harvesting really revolutionized the field. And then morselizing or chopping the fat up into smaller and smaller particles really revolutionized the field. So for example, we use three different sizes of fat molecules when we do the face. First, I use a 2.4 morselization. And what that does is that's really useful for building up lost volume along the bone, deep ligaments, that kind of stuff. 
Then we have a 1.2, which is a smaller fraction, which is really useful for getting underneath the skin. And finally, we have a nano fat fraction, which is super small, has stem cells within it, and that's really useful for intradermal or into the skin injection. So you can see that this is kind of a multi-layered injection. So when we kind of look at fat transfer, I think it's also important to understand where we're coming from, where we're going, and all sorts of these things. So now you kind of have a little bit of a historical perspective of where fat transfer came from, and you also understand how facial fat transfer differs from body liposuction. So let's put that in one box over there and we'll kind of continue down this process. Let's talk a little bit about aging. There's several videos on here on, on my YouTube channel where I talk about facial aging. So facial aging is not a one step, hey, I woke up one day and all my, my tissues started sagging. There's a lot more to facial aging than that. So what's really happening is, is during the course of time, we are losing some amount of volume. That's one portion of facial aging. So there've been tons of studies to show that if I took a CT scan of my face when I was 15 or 20 years old, and then maybe every five to 10 years after that, the amount of bone volume that I would have in my skull of my face would actually go down over time. So we're losing not only bone volume, but also the volume of the tissues themselves that cover the bone in terms of collagen, elastin, and all these different other proteins. So when we look at facial rejuvenation, I want to turn the clock back, okay? We can pull the tissues, That's, that part can be done, but another component of that is to actually re-volumize the tissues or increase the amount of volume, and that's done by fat transfer. Now, moving along, one of the other things that could be done for revolumization is fillers. Fillers really gained popularity in the 90s and within about five to six years after their initial popularity, you started getting amazing numbers of filler. So you originally just had Restylane and Juvederm and then you started getting Restylane Define and Restylane Lift and Juvederm Ultra Plus and all these different things. Now, Getting really into the filler aspect of things is beyond the scope of this talk, but I think it is important to mention that for probably a decade and a half, fillers really held the, the throne as the primary modality for revolumization of the face. It was easy, you just get it off of a shelf. Now, if you spoke to me, let's say you called me up probably 15 years ago and said, hey, I wanna add some volume, my go-to would be fillers. But knowing what I know today, knowing what I know with you know the thousands of facelifts that I've done, what I am learning more and more and more over and over again is fillers are not as benign as they claim to be. So what happens is, even though that fillers are made in the laboratory, have no immunogenic potential, and to top it all off, um, they are supposedly dissolvable, uh, that your body eats it up over time, when you inject that into the body tissues, there is a tissue reaction. So when I go and see facelifts, it's rare for me to see a facelift today where the patient has never had any fillers or anything like that. When I go and lift up the tissues in areas where there've been filler, many times I will find filler, many times I will find some degree of scarring in the tissue planes that decreases my ability to really dissect very smoothly. So the long and the short of this are fillers are not as benign as they claim to be, and there is some degree of tissue interaction. So I have completely, probably over the last five to seven years, switched my thought process, especially since I've gotten more and more education on this and seen it in my patients, to really be a fat advocate. I like fat. Sounds really crazy, but I like fat. So the great things with fat are almost no tissue reaction. It's your own tissue. And you're really able to layer the fat in multiple layers, use different densities and uh, particle sizes to get a very, very natural result. 
This is why I love it. On the other hand, if you were to argue with me and say, does fat have the same pushing power that filler does? The answer to that is no. Fat does not have the same ability to push the tissues out. So fillers are not bad in my hands since I do a lot of facial rejuvenation. I prefer fat. I think the rewards, the uh, softness, the natural look, the less tissue interaction, all that put together makes it a superior filling material. So now we've kind of discussed historical, what makes it different from body fat transfer, body liposuction, and the basis for why I love fat so much. Okay, so I get a lot of comments. Um, Hi, I'm seeing some tissue sagging. Can I do a facial fat transfer? Right off the bat, I'm gonna tell you, there is no singular, hey, this is the one answer can fix everything. That doesn't exist in facial plastic surgery. Now, for 99.9999999999% of my facelifts, I always include fat in there. And so fat is a great ancillary procedure to a facelift, why? Because the facelift itself is lifting the tissues and the fat can replenish some of the volume of those lifted tissues, both bone volume, deep tissue volume, skin volume, and intra-skin volume, okay? So this is why I like fat. The other aspect of this is, is that when I do fat transfer, usually I'm putting 15, 20 cc's of fat in there, which is like 15 or 20 syringes. So you can very quickly calculate what the cost of 15 or 20 syringes of filler are and go, all right, I see that you're getting way more volume replenishment with fat than you are with filler. Where some patients really don't make that connection is they go, oh, so I don't need a facelift. I can just go ahead and put fat in my face. Doesn't work that way. So first of all, I'm not really an advocate of the filler lift or the non-surgical, you know, I think there's lots of different names for it, but just put a bunch of filler in your face. In a person with very, very mild aging, where there's not a lot of droopiness of the tissue, where they've just lost some volume, that is a perfect candidate for just revolumization. I do this frequently in young patients where they sometimes have volume loss along the eye, maybe a little bit of laxity of skin, where I can do a lower bluff and add a little bit of fat, something to that effect. Now, on the other hand, if there has already been significant dropping or falling or ptosis of the tissues, the fat's not going to be able to lift it up. And for plain and simple, neither is filler, but for the purpose of this talk, you cannot just lift tissues with fat. So I think we have to make that demarcation right there where we go, number one, is there dropping or ptosis of the tissues or is there just loss of volume? If there's just loss of volume, great fat candidate. If there is drooping of the tissues, you're probably gonna need something else besides just fat transfer. So I hope that makes sense. The next common question I get is, where do you get the fat from, doc? Okay, so I normally like to get the fat from three locations. My favorite is right here in the anterior portion of the abdomen. Two, I'll go for the flanks, and three, I'll go for the medial aspect of the thighs. So those are my common places, and between those places, I can usually get the amount of fat that I need. So when I do my liposuction, I usually take out somewhere between 60 to 100 cc's of stuff. That stuff is called lipoaspirate. The lipoaspirate is a combination of fat, some oil, as well as some blood and some other fluids, some of the anesthesia fluids that may have been injected in the tissues. We spin that stuff down to get rid of all the other stuff except just the fat. That pure fat is then processed in order to give us the different fractions or the different particle sizes of fat that we're gonna use to inject the face. So, I hope all of this makes sense to you in terms of why we do it, how we do it, and now let's talk a little bit more about patient selection. We've already discussed the fact that fat's a great thing to revolumize tissues, number one, and it can be used also in order to build the tissues up in terms of volume. However, there's some added value benefits to fat which you definitely don't get with filler. The stuff that we're getting out from the fat 
also has stem cells in it. So not only can you revolumize tissue, not only can you add volume and it acts as a space filler, you're also creating the capacity to build more collagen, build more elastin and overall revolumize the face with the regenerative process. So the fat actually has stuff in it to help regenerate the tissues. Again, many patients will go, can I just do that and I can continue doing fat and I'll never need a facelift. Odds of that are very low. Fat's a good, it, it, it's great. It's good for what it is. Is it going to prevent you from getting a facelift or prevent you from ever needing something? Probably not, okay? It may delay it, it may push it off a little bit. And it also depends on what the patient's goals are. So if I have a 50 year old patient who really says, hey, I'd really like to take 15 or 20 years off the clock, there's no way that I'm gonna be able to do that with fat alone. Okay. On the other hand, I have a 35 year old girl who says, Hey, I have just a little bit of hollowing here and I just want to, uh, uh, to freshen up and look younger and more awake can definitely do that with fat as a standalone procedure. So kind of to sum up what it is, how it is, how it works. Number one, fat is a great filler material. In my opinion, I think it is way better than traditional fillers. Three, the other thing that it does is it has a regenerative capacity to allow you to regrow tissues and proteins that are within the tissues. And it's a great adjunctive procedure, especially for facelifts and other facial plastic surgery procedure. Now let's talk a little bit about what are the trends with respect to fat transfer. Fat transfer has gotten a lot of traction is really trending probably over the last four to five years. I've been doing fat transfer in excess of 10 or 12 years, but it has really taken steam up in the last four to five years and a lot of people have started talking about it. I think that there has been a lot more information out about the fact that fillers are not as benign as they claim to be. Furthermore, patients are also looking into the fact that how do I do procedures that are more natural and last longer term? So this brings up another last point with respect to the longevity of fat. So most fillers will last anywhere between six to 12 months. That's a ballpark. Some of them you may get 13 or 14 months, but that's pretty much what you're gonna get out of almost all of the filler agents. Fat is permanent. What do I mean by that? So there've been plenty of studies to show that when you inject fat transfer using the techniques that we use, you can actually see that same fat. They can radio label the fat and then check down the road. And that fat has basically survived long term. However, you will continue to age. So you will continue to lose volume. On average, I think a fat transfer patient is probably going to come back to me in about six to seven years and say, hey, it looked fantastic. I think I've lost a little bit more volume. Can you add a little bit more fat? And the answer to that is yes. So at six to seven years, it's not that the fat is lost or you lost the fat. Most likely you've continued to lose some volume, which kind of throws you over that threshold where you feel that there's some volume loss and would like to have a little bit more rejuvenation. So this is a lot of information about fat. What I've really tried to do is take into account a lot of the questions that I've received and put them all together for kind of a comprehensive video on fat transfer. I really hope that this has helped you. I hope you've kind of found it very engaging and kind of maybe you found something new that you hadn't thought of before. From another perspective, also think about fat as a kind of a, it's like icing on the cake. So doing a facelift or a lower eyelid or any other type of surgery is kind of building the wedding cake and the fat really acts like icing on top of the cake. This is why I love it so much. If you found this video engaging, you liked it, you wanna know more, you wanna be kept up to date on further videos that we post out here, please hit the subscribe button. If you have comments, questions, please hit them down below and I will try to get to them as soon as I can. Otherwise, you can always call the office. We love teaching patients. This is Dr. Othre, Othre Facial Plastics. Thank you so much for listening.